uh, faith like Mary's. This was what I saw in Planning Center when I turned it on to find out what it is that I was preaching on. I was like, okay, that's, that's very descriptive. Uh, I don't have a lot to go on, but that, that's fine. That's fine. We can work with this. Um, and so I, I started out by thinking, faith, faith, faith. What, what exactly does faith mean as a word? It's one of those weird churchy words these days, I think. Like, if I asked you to tell me, like for real, what, what does the word faith mean? What would you tell me? Believing in something you can't see. Okay, somebody's read her Bible. That's great. Any other, any other definitions? Yeah, yeah, you get your Bible college win. Okay, okay, okay. Do we have, do we have any, like, non-Bible college answers? Your sister's friend. Okay, that's, you know, a really popular George Michael song. It's kind of a hard word to define, Right? It's kind of like trust. Okay, that's, that's like the closest thing to a non-Bible word definition that we've got. It's, it's a hard word to define, right? And, and Michelle and Carol Ann are pointing to this uh, passage in Hebrews 11 where it says, Now faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. Except even that, you got to admit, that's still kind of a fake definition. I don't know that I know more. I'm not sure that would pass the academic tests for definitions that I have to do at school. I don't think it would get, I, it wouldn't clear my prof. He's, he's a stickler for spe specificity. And I think the author of Hebrews knows this, but faith is just really hard to define. And so they spend the entire rest of the chapter giving us a bunch of examples. Faith is like Faith is like this person. Faith is like this person. Faith is like this person, right? And, and it's, it, they, they kind of couch it in this way that you almost get a sense of it being like the, the faith hall of fame. It's even called that at the top of some of the sections in the Bible. And so, you know, if you think hockey hall of fame, well, like, if you didn't know how the game of hockey was played, you know, if, for example, you had never watched the game of hockey carefully and you hadn't actually figured out how it worked, and, you know, when they put you in charge of pushing the button to tell whether a team had gotten a goal or not at Hockey Helps the Homeless. You were a little bit confused as to how that works. I don't know anybody who might have been in that position recently. <laughs> Anyways, it's like, it's like they tried to explain the game of hockey through uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame, and they just said, you know, Gretzky did these things, and Lemur is a hockey guy too, right? So, Lemure did these things, and I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Hockey people, they did hockey things. And then you're like, okay, now I kind of know what hockey is a little bit, maybe, or maybe not, right? And I feel like that's a little bit what we get in the book of Hebrews. We get this recount of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. And then the author tells us that there's all these other ones that he doesn't have time to tell us about. Or she doesn't. We don't actually know. Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. It's a fun thing. Um, and for each of these people, the author gives us an example of what it is that made that person faithful so that we get this composite view of faithful acts, acts of obedience that make no sense at the time. Like building a huge boat miles and miles from the sea in a part of the world that gets no water, uh, or journeying across a desert looking for a place to call home when you had a perfectly good home where you left, or, or giving up a place in the palace to identify with the slaves in Egypt and spend... 40 years in uh, exile out in the wilderness. A lot of these people don't actually get everything they were promised either. Like, like some of them do. Rahab gets to survive uh, the fall of the walls of Jericho, and, and, and Abraham gets his son, well, more than one in the end. Um, and, and, and so some of them get some of the promises, but maybe don't see all of the promises. Abraham doesn't get all of the land of Israel in his lifetime. That takes 400 more years before that happens. 
Some of them only get these tasters of the fulfillment of their faith. But somehow these actions tell us that they did have faith, that they were sure of that hope and certain of what they couldn't see. They did what that last song talked about. They waited for God, hoping and living as if that hope would one day show up. And the author's point seems to be that they waited for something they couldn't see, the coming of the Messiah. And we, like the author's first readers, are waiting for something we can't see yet either, the return of Jesus. But in between those two very long and unknown times of waiting, waiting for the Messiah and waiting for Jesus to return again, there's this one fleeting moment of a few years. A moment where a young teenage girl was working in her parents' house maybe one day as she awaited the day she would marry the man she was engaged to. This was the thing she was sure of at the time. The thing that she had hoped for at the time. The one day promise of her life. Sure, she waited for the Messiah, but there, that was a waiting that was like deep in the ancestral bones of her people. And if I know anything about young women, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that sh at this time and at this place with a man known as being as good and as faithful and as upright as Joseph was, that Mary eagerly awaited the day that she would be married and have her own home and her own family. I can see that happening. I think she was pretty keen on it. And this was what she had trained for and looked forward to for years. And then something happens. We bit unexpected. Then she has a, a moment. This moment when an angel appeared with the angelic announcement, do not be afraid, which, like Nathan told us last week, is how angels always announce themselves. Uh, it's kind of a bad thing to have to start with that, right? Leading in, before you can even say, hi, I'm Gabe, you know, you might have seen me on shows like, no, he just has to start with, don't be afraid. Okay, now we can have a conversation. Um, anyways, Mary somehow finds herself unafraid enough at least to be able to take in some of what the angel is saying. We know this because they actually have a back and forth conversation and she sounds like she's heard his previous sentence. And so if she was terrified, I'm not sure that would happen. But um, this is what we have recorded by Luke. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of, the, of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, for any of you who have ever been pregnant, or any of you who have ever had a partner who ever got pregnant, you will know that there is this initial moment of, oh my goodness, I'm pregnant. Right? Yep. Yeah, that, that checks out. That checks out. At least a few of you have had that experience. But then, after that moment, there's also these weeks of waiting, of wondering, of questioning. Am I really? Is that really what it said? Is that really what's happening? Is this really for real? And that's in spite of all of our blood tests and ultrasounds and all the things we have. Like, I have worked with pregnant people for 20 years. We get worried. We're not so sure what's going on, right? Back in the day, without ever doing the thing that Mary knows full well is necessary to make a baby, well, simply accepting that she would conceive a baby was pretty impossible, right? Much less the rest of it. Sure, as Carol Ann mentioned earlier, Mary would have known all the references the angel was making. She would have known that this was going to be the Messiah from those places, phrases the angel was using. 
But we also have this sense from the rest of the responses around the Christmas story, from the shepherds and the wise men, and even from the way that it's written in Matthew and Luke, that no one really quite expected the Messiah to be born to a poor peasant girl from the backwater country of Nazareth. The expectation, everyone's expectation, it would have seemed, was that the Messiah would be born to someone rich and powerful and important, raised in a palace or at least a nice cushy home, maybe right close to Jerusalem where he could go to the temple whenever he wanted to and do all the sacrifices every year, and, and maybe even get waited on by some servants, you know, as was his right. And all of a sudden, that's not the story that Mary's hearing. She had faith that the Messiah was going to come someday. But this encounter, be, before this encounter, she had faith that she was going to get married and be Joseph's wife one day. She had faith maybe that one day she was going to be a mom or at least some hope of that. She might have even hoped um, to have, some ch have lots of children and raise them to adulthood. But in this moment, everything she had always had faith in came crashing down like an ill-fated Jenga tower. Now what? Suddenly the story doesn't make any sense. How can she keep her faith when everything that faith relied on has just come tumbling to the ground? Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? How can this be since I am a virgin? How can this be since it would mess up all my assumptions about what the Messiah is supposed to look like and what my life is supposed to look like? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy he will be called Son of God. Okay, so let me get this straight. Holy Spirit is going to come upon her, and she's going to be overshadowed by the power of the Most High, and then she's going to conceive a baby, and that's going to be the Son of God. What? If you hadn't heard this every single Christmas, for your whole life, this would sound nuts, right? Mary would have known the story of Moses on the mountain asking to see God, too. She would have known that God had to hide Moses' face from seeing God directly because that would have been too much for Moses. And here's Mary being told that God is going to impregnate her with God's son. And I wonder whether she wondered if she could do all of that and even somehow live. The angel doesn't seem to tell her any more than that. There's this like side memo of that Elizabeth, who is old and barren, and Mary's cousin is also pregnant as a way of suggesting that God really can do wild and crazy things, but that's it. That's all we know about the conversation except Mary's response. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Here's the thing. We can think ahead to how the story goes and know that Mary will survive birth and time in Egypt and all the rest, but Mary doesn't know this yet. In this moment, Mary knows none of these things. All she knows is that this angel is telling her that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. And she says yes. And she doesn't just say yes with her fingers crossed behind her back. She just doesn't just do whatever she has to do to get the terrifying angel to go away. This isn't like the things you say to the pushy door-to-door -door salesman when you just need them to leave because the dinner's burning on the stove and the kids have already launched well into World War III with each other for the third time today and you're running late to get ready before the babysitter comes so you can go to the, your very important meeting this evening at the school because of, you know, the kids. That yes is not this yes. This yes is a full unequivocal yes to whatever this means for her life. Why does she say yes? 
How does she say yes? Is it because the request came from an angel? Because she's known about the Messiah her whole life and feels honored to be called to serve in this way? Maybe. Or maybe it's because she's been practicing a life of faith since she was a little, little girl. And the only possible answer feels like yes. Maybe she knows what happened to Jonah and the whale. And we don't know if Mary was automatically sure about the whole thing either. That's not clear. We don't know if this yes was a tiny squeak of a yes or a full-bodied assured yes. She can't see the baby yet. She can't feel the baby yet. No fluttering in her own womb yet. No reassuring kicks or wiggles or an ultrasound to confirm that what she's been told is actually going to happen. But either way, she does decide to go see her cousin Elizabeth, who I guess she figures, if nothing else, will understand this whole visited by an angel thing. And when she gets there, Elizabeth's baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. And Elizabeth prophesies that Mary is blessed and will be the mother of the Lord. And at that point, this is what Mary says. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel and remembered in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Whether it was immediate or whether it took until this moment with Elizabeth hardly matters in the grand scheme of things. Within just a few days or weeks, Mary has the faith to fully accept that this is really happening and to see what the logical implications of this are that the prophecies about the Messiah are going to come true and that they are going to come true in the baby that she is carrying. That is a lot of faith. That's a very, very big hope. But there's a lot, also a lot here that she can't see yet. And a long time before she's going to be able to see it. So I think this moment with Elizabeth is a faith-building moment. It's a confirmation that what the angel told her is going to happen, and that's going to bolster her faith. And then we have the story of the shepherds that Nathan told last week, uh, and it ends by saying that Mary treasured all these things up in her heart and pondered them. And although it doesn't say it in Matthew, it sounds like Mary might have had a similar opportunity when the three wise men came to visit her and brought their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh several months later. Or a couple of years later. That's dicey. We don't know exactly. But these are faith-building moments too. But then, after that, there's this great, big, long silence. After the trip to Egypt and back again, there is all the day-in, day-out monotony of diapers and feedings and scraped knees and childhood sadnesses interrupted once a week with the lighting of the candles for Sabbath. There are the years and years of raising a child that we know nothing about. Are there signs that Jesus is the Son of God in his childhood? We don't really know. And we might think that in all these years Mary has forgotten what the angel said or started to disbelieve it, but no, that's not what John 4 suggests. Do you guys remember John 4? Nathan had fun preaching on it. That was like last year. That was a long time ago. But he had fun with it. This is the wedding at Cana. This is the moment where weddings that went on 
at the time for days, and you were supposed to start putting away wine when your daughter was born so that you could have plenty to serve your guests for the whole length of the feast. And Jesus and Mary are at this wedding, and the wine runs out. This is a colossal faux pas. This is like O'Hara's running out of alcohol on New Year's Eve. You don't do that. It's not, it's not good. You think COVID was bad for business. This is really bad for business. It's kind of the end of whatever this family's social standing was going into this wedding. They would have been the laughing stock of the region over this. But like, no one is dying. It's a big deal to this family, but it's not a, a big deal, big deal, right? You know? But this is where we see that Mary hasn't forgotten who Jesus is. She tells Jesus to solve the problem, and he says, it's not time yet. And I get the sense from this little interaction that they have had this conversation maybe for years. Like, any of you with young adult children will know that dance we go through with our kids as we try not to nag, but try to get them to get started with a career or a school or a job or something or anything that gets them out of the house. The have you thought about and when you when were you thinking you'd or maybe you could conversations that go on in so many households all over the country every day this this feels like one of those and it feels like one of those that has happened so many times there are barely any words needed to have it. Like Jesus can almost see the words forming in Mary's head before she opens her mouth. And he's already sighing and opening his mouth to say, not today, Mom. I'll get to it, but not today. Am I right? Anybody vibing with this? Except this time Mary's done waiting. And somehow she has enough faith, enough surety in what she hopes for, and certainty of what she has not seen, or just enough fed upness, I'm not sure which, that she turns to the servants and tells them to do whatever Jesus tells them, and then walks away, knowing, like the best mothers, that you can't possibly get your kid to do what they need to do if they think they're in a battle of wills with you. But if you walk away, they just might be able to save enough face to be able to get on with it, finally. And Jesus does. He tells them to fill the big purification jugs with water and then tells them to dip a ladle in and take it to the steward to taste it. Only what they take to the steward isn't water anymore, it's wine. And it's not the crappy, cheap wine that you would assume had been kept back for the end of the party when everyone was already fully enjoying themselves. It was the best wine ever. But as hard as some of you will find it to believe, the wine isn't actually the point here. The point here is that Mary's faith is enough to move God's timeline and prompt Jesus' first miracle. It's a lot of faith she's got there. So, in both the Orthodox and Catholic traditions, Mary is venerated above any of the other saints. She is the Theotokos, the one who gave birth to God. They have icons and statues and hymns and prayers of, to, of Mary, to Mary, and for Mary. She's kind of a big deal. Like, you know, don't tell Justin Bieber or anything, but she's got more followers than he does, just saying. We don't really go in for all of that in the Protestant world, but I wonder whether we've lost something important in the mix. In our fear of putting Mary on par with God, which I'm not for a second suggesting we should do, nor am I suggesting actually that Catholic and Orthodox practice does either, for the record. I think we've lost sight of some awesome things we can learn about faith and faithfulness from Mary in our attempt to differentiate ourselves from the Catholic and Orthodox tradition in this way. The first thing I noticed is that Mary's faith is not blind. She doesn't trust God's promises out of thin air. Like Carol Ann said earlier, she knew about the coming of the Messiah from childhood. She knew what that was supposed to look like, knew what he was supposed to bring, knew the whole thing. So when the angel turned up 
and started talking about the God of, Son of God whose kingdom will have no end. She knows what he's talking about. We've got hints of this idea of preparing or being prepared to live a life of faith in the stories the author of Hebrews gives us as well. So many of these people have direct experiences with God or with God's people who teach them about God, that gives them the courage and the hope and the certainty to exercise faith when the time comes for each of them. So I think that the first thing we can learn about faith from Mary is that if we want to live faithful lives, we have to be actively, intentionally connected with God and with God's people. We need to read our Bibles on our own as well as learning in sermons or reading books about what the Bible says. We need to be praying on our own as well as with each other. We need to be engaged in some of the other spiritual practices that help us to develop faith like Sabbath and rest and and quiet and solitude. And I've got a whole book on spiritual practices if you want ideas about that. But we need to be asking questions and digging deeper into who God is and what God said about God and us and the world and all the rest of it so that we have a firm foundation to plant our faith on. The second thing I notice about Mary's faith is that it is built up through multiple reinforcing experiences. She doesn't just hear from the angel herself and then that's it. No more reassurance for you. Just go out there and have the Son of God as an unmarried virgin. Good luck. That's not what happens. She hears from the angel, and from that experience, she's told about Elizabeth's pregnancy. And she goes and sees Elizabeth, whose unborn baby and her own prophecy reconfirm what the angel told Mary. Maybe even before Mary had the chance to tell Elizabeth what was going on. The angel visits Joseph, and he decides, instead of quietly divorcing her, to take her as his wife, but wait to consummate the marriage until she's given birth. Then the shepherds show up after Jesus is born with a tale of the entire heavenly chorus singing to them out in the hills. And the wise men show up from the east with their story of the star, and each of these things Mary treasures up in her heart. They are the confirmation of what she heard. She doesn't just have that one moment to go on. She's got backup after backup after backup. And this can be true for us too, if only we look for it. So if we sense that God is calling us to act in a certain way, to take a risk, to walk by faith in some fashion, we don't have to guess about whether this is from God or not. We can and should check in with other people who we think we see following Jesus well. Right? People we, whose faith we respect and who we have witnessed as being wise. And then the third thing I notice is that Mary starts to take steps as if what she has been told is going to happen. She doesn't wait until her belly is big and Jesus is doing somersaults that keep her up all night. She doesn't wait until morning sickness or all day sickness keeps her trapped at home. She pretty much immediately gets up and goes to see Elizabeth. She goes to find safety, sure. She goes to find a place to lay low while everybody figures out what to do, perhaps. But she goes in expectant faith and hope that she will find a pregnant Elizabeth. Because that's the one, that's one of the things the angel had told her. She starts to act on her faith, and in doing so, her faith is enhanced. Do you see how that works? I think this is crucial to how we are called to live. And from all of this, I would say that faith doesn't exist just by gritting our teeth and being sure enough of what we hope for and certain enough of what we don't see. This isn't about putting good intentions out into the universe with enough intensity. Faith is developed and built up by this very engaged cycle of being rooted in our relationships with God, confirmed through our relationship with one another, and then actively engaged with through the baby steps we take in response to it. And the more times we go round and round this cycle, the deeper our faith can develop. That's how we develop our faith. And to that end, my hope is that it's got something useful in it for you. But there is one problem with this, even though I've been talking for a while, and I'm going to do it anyways. The problem with this is that it doesn't tell us what we do when that faith feels like it's been shattered. When life has thrown one too many curveballs at us and we feel like there's just minuscule faith shards lying all over the floor. 
At the end of his life, during the narrative of Jesus' death, we are going to see that one of the people present at the foot of the cross watching his execution is Mary. His mother is standing there as Jesus entrusts her care to John from the cross. She has to not only watch her son be crucified, but she has to do so without having... with. She has to do so having been told and having had faith his whole life that it was true for 33 years that he was the Messiah. She has to watch all the promises she was given seemingly shatter in front of her eyes as his body is broken. So what happens when we feel like all of the hope is lost? Where do we turn when nothing we feel certain about in the past feels possible in the here and now? When the verses we've clung to or the songs we've sung with passion and gusto feel empty and hollow and useless in the face of the overwhelming mountain of evidence before us. When our child dies or our marriage crumbles or our loved one gets a terminal illness diagnosis or something else happens to shatter the faith we had in God and God's plans. We've been going through the books of the Bible together with the youth this week fall and this past week we got to the book of Job and I was reminded again that the message of Job is that what faith looks like in the darkness is wrestling with God when we have lost absolutely everything that matters to us a faithful response is to cling on to God to cry out to God to pound our fists and show up before God over and over and over again even when we're not even 100,000% sure God's still there. Faith in the midst of our suffering goes right back to the beginning of our faith cycle, to the most basic practices of a life of faith found in active obedience to the practices of daily life. In many ways, it puts the details about hope and certainty, about the big questions to one side, and allows us to cling onto faith by doing the next right thing. Although it's not entirely clear from Scripture, the tradition of both the Orthodox and Catholic Church is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was one of the Marys who went to the tomb very early in the morning of the first day of the week. They went with their faith in Jesus as Messiah in shatters and completely expected to find his dead body in the tomb. In fact, that's precisely why they had gone in the first place, right? They went to do the rituals of death, the basic practices of Jewish life that happened whenever someone died and were meant to be done by the women closest to the deceased. They had lost Jesus, and I am certain that along with being bereft, they were wildly confused about what that meant in terms of who they believed Jesus to be, but they knew that their job was to get up that morning and do the next right thing. In some ways, you could argue that they had lost their faith. Despite what Jesus had said on multiple occasions through his life, they had no expectation that they were going to find a living Jesus that morning. They expected that he would be dead. But what they found in their faithfulness to the next right thing was their faith restored and expanded in terms of who Jesus was. His death was not the end of the story, it turned out. It turned out it was the beginning of a new, even better sequel. So wherever you're at in your faith journey today, I don't want to paint some rosy, everything will be perfectly fine image of faith for us. I have had lots of moments in my own life where I thought there was nothing left. Lots of times where I fell apart and figured that was the end of it all. And I know that the process of doing the next right thing the process of holding on to hope is rarely solved in a matter of 36 hours like it was for Mary that day. It's certainly rarely been my experience. But it has been my experience that when I go back to the everyday practices of faith in the midst of my brokenness, to showing up and doing the next right thing, to practicing the rituals of faith, even when it feels a little hollow and empty for a while, what starts to build up is a new, deeper life of faith than I could have ever asked for or imagined. So this morning, 
whether you're feeling like you're full of hope and certainty and the faith that entails, or whether your faith is hanging on in, hanging in shards around you, confetti small pieces blowing in the breeze. My hope for you is that you will hear in Mary's story a way to keep going, that you will find in Mary's faith a path back to God and to God's people and to the active next steps of faith that first captured your soul. Can the worship team come back up? I'll just pray. Loving and faithful God, whether we want to sing in your delight at your faithfulness and love and the way we've seen them lived out in our life, or whether we want to yell and scream and stomp our feet at you this morning, we recognize that even in our choice to show up this morning, we have a seed of faith, a seed of hope that you are real, a seed of certainty that you are present and working, that you love us and care for us. Would you encourage us in our faith through the life and faith of Mary? Would you give us the opportunity to have our faith reinforced through our interactions with those you place in our lives? Would we have the courage to test our faith out in practice, in our day-to-day -day reality, and when we feel like hope is lost and certainty is non-existent, would you give us the courage to start back at the beginning with the next right thing, with the basic building blocks of faith, even when our hearts are screaming that it's futile. With the tenacity of fingernails sunk deep into your skin, would we find a way to hold on to our faith? And when even that feels impossible, would you allow us to feel you carrying us on eagle's wings? Amen. Amen.